You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Well, folks, we are back on Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. And it is time for round two with my guest, Benjamin Brody. Now, you may be thinking, Dan Duvall, you know, I'm watching you on YouTube. Now, for those of you that are not watching on YouTube, you can't see this. But for those of you that are watching on YouTube, you will notice that I am wearing the same shirt that I wore the last time I interviewed Benjamin Brody. You'll also notice Benjamin Brody's beard is the same length, mm -hmm. and he is still wearing the same shirt he was wearing. Did, did we connect and communicate and, 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 and no, no, I am actually mm -hmm. recording this interview immediately after the last one where I left you all on a massively inconvenient and rude cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? Because I couldn't wait to get the rest of the story, but I made you wait because that's how you do good radio. So <laughs> Benjamin cool. Brody, welcome back to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Thank you for having me back. Oh my gosh. You know, um, we, we got into it last time, Benjamin, on, on your story, talking about um, your autism. Now, folks, mm. here's a little bit of background, kind of catching us up to uh, where we are. We learned last week that Benjamin Brody's family bloodline, the, the Brody bloodline, goes back mm. a thousand years. Their family crest includes two giants, Gog and Magog, and they mm. tie into an agenda that is very, very deeply rooted in the occult world. And for that reason, Benjamin Brody in his generation was selected. He was mm. selected mm. Um, to be part of what he calls the collective. And the, the way that manifested was through autism that started in his life at the age of two, mm. according to his memory, when he was targeted at the outset by succubus spirits. They took him into another realm. They parented him. They abused him. They traumatized him, sexualized him, and they served up human flesh. They dehumanized him intentionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, he journeyed years of his life, not, not being diagnosed as autistic, but on one side of the veil, in the natural, having all the outward signs of autism, but on the other side of the veil, he told us he was navigating things like being a high-born reptile, flying mm. on craft, being involved in engineering projects, uh, <laughs> going after energy beings to harness their energy for space travel, mm. and even abducting humans in league with others. Yeah. Benjamin, you have lived quite a life, my friend. Oh, yeah. It seems like I've lived several good, <laughs> several lives. Uh, luckily, I've only got one now. <laughs> 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 one, made one in Jesus, yes. <laughs> so we're kind of picking up in your story. And, and folks, if you haven't heard part one, stop, find it, listen to it, and then listen to this. Okay, you got to get the back, back story. Now, uh, we are kind of around the time that you are 16 years old, Benjamin. Mm. Um, and I have a question uh, to, to pick up on your story here at 16. Did your role with the collective evolve as you grew physically? Um, it became more technical. Uh, so one of the things that if you look up famous Brodies is that they're all scientists, engineers, craftsmen, technical people. So I, like I said, um, most of my role was involved with the technology side of things, figuring out how different interfaces would work, how different, how to improve our spacefaring technology and our interface with our subjects in the collective. And so, it be, as I grew, it became more technical, it became more ruthless. And I think for me, the, the, um, 
the veneer of the collective started to fall to pieces. Uh, it didn't seem as um, cohesive and unified as one would think. And it's really interesting because a lot of it has to do with the greys. Uh, so last week we talked about greys, how they were autonomous kind of flesh robots that we that would be used by uh, demons and and other entities to inhabit and then go off. That we would use that, those for our field trips, you know, landing on Earth, going collecting items and whatnot because they were expendable and cheaply made literally that we talk about alien grace having amphibious skins they were literally amphibians you know we would have giant bats of tadpoles that where we would mass produce these things the problem was that because we had to develop their mind with the capacity to contain a de demonic or human uh, consciousness uh, they would often have intelligence of their own if left to their own devices and so quelling uprises, uprisings within the ranks uh, was one of the main roles that was happening so you had you were starting to see you know things that were as I go older, I started to see things with the collective that weren't as harmonious and well-rounded as I thought it would have been or should have been. So on the frontiers, we were dealing with these energy creatures uh, that were becoming increasingly hostile and causing heaps and heaps of damage out way out in deep space, but internally, you had infighting and you had factionalism as well as um yeah these uprisings of the greys and whatnot and also with the other reptilians so you had the highborn which were the dragons and then you had the others who were the smooth skin uh there were a lot of xenophobia in the ranks so any, any given ship would have a number of different species all in ranks. So you'd have one or two of the high ball, uh, the fallen angels, you know, per ship, you know, in high command duty. You know, you'd have the rank below being the high born uh, reptiles. And then you have the other reptiles and then you have whatever other species you were carrying and then millions and millions of probes as we as we called them which were the alien greys and so you had this powder keg of rival factions ready to go off at any time if at any point that fallen angel was unable to regain control of their ship wow wow so the dynamics evolved as you were aging physically. Mm. The way things were working on that side of the veil, so to speak. Mm. My goodness. Yeah. Which translated to um, more erratic, paranoid, violent behavior on both sides. So interesting. Now tell me a little bit more about this um, because you talk to us about these implants that you would make or design. So mm. when certain individuals were abducted there, they could be uplinked, so to speak. Mm. Now, what would from your vantage point that mm. uplink allow for? Why did the collective that you were involved with want all these people uplinked? Well, the, the uplink was a shortcut mm -hmm. because this uh, collective empire was actually way out in deep space. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, they did not feel comfortable going anywhere near Earth. 
there was there was something on earth that they feared and so they would they would go undercover in stealth implant some people you know send out messages uh relay back and forth information based on what was going on earth to the collective the collective would make a decision and send back messages that kind of thing uh, the person would experience uh, a hallucination of the entity that they were talking to uh, kind of like what what you would see in star wars with a hologram except it was entirely orchestrated within the communication centers of the brain uh, so you literally hot wired those parts of the brain to show an image or and hear their voice you know, and it's so interesting that you say that. And, and let me explain this. Okay, so there was a time where I was working with someone. This story is going to sound crazy, right? But mm. hey, that's why we're here on Discovering Truth, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm working with someone and I meet a person on the inside of this individual. And uh, this is a person that is part of the secret space program. Mm. And they're like 97 years old. I'm making that number up. I don't remember. They were very old mm. and much older than the person whose body they were in. And this person that I'm talking, that, that comes to the front of the body and starts talking to me, I say, well, how'd you get in here? They explain to me, well, uh, this is kind of like my docking station for the secret space program. So they, you know, my body expired, but they still needed me. Mm. So my body was disposed of certain ways and I was docked in this vessel. Interesting. Mm. And they went on to explain to me several things about what they called the restrainer. They're like, yeah, let me explain to you the, the, what we're working on uh, because they then met Jesus and went with him and he actually saved them out of the vessel of the individual, the secret suit program, put them in. Wow, which that's cool. Is like a very, very, you know, the, the, the grace of Jesus Christ goes very, very far, folks. Yeah. But, you know, before he takes this part out, uh, they're, they're telling me about the restraint. And they're like, yeah, see, uh, we, we can get through holes, mm. but there's a lot that can't just come in. And so mm. we are working to remove it. They're, they're, that's a, a huge agenda is trying to get it out of the way. And so the Bible says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Mm. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he is taken out of the way. And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, now I'm beginning to get it that there are holes in the restrainer that are navigated by certain things, but access is limited. Mm. Now you're describing the same thing to me. Like they, <laughs> they're just sneaking in, getting a little bit here, a little bit there, projecting messages. They're trying to get, and, and this is the thing, you, you move into the new age realm, what are they trying to do? Synchronize the universal consciousness vibration through mm. mankind's agreements to ascend yeah. as a race or a species. They're trying to do it, to mm. essentially take the restrainer out of the way with this plan. I don't think that's ever going to work. I, uh, but anyway, getting yeah. away from that, uh, it's yeah. so interesting, the parallels. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, like I said, I'm just I'm just speaking from my individual experience. I haven't collaborated with anyone about this. Like I was saying before with Dan, is like I haven't actually sat down and told the whole thing from start to finish to a person before now. I've told bits and pieces and let let people gauge from that. But yeah, confirmation is. That's that's really cool. That's really interesting. Like the things that I was working on actually corroborates with things that you're removing. Um, so so tell me a little bit more. They're they're in deep space. They're implanting mm -hmm. people. They're projecting messages. So what did you perceive their goals to be? So their goals were uh, obviously to uh, incorporate humanity into their collective. They're obviously trying to amass a massive fleet of very powerful ships they're trying to coalesce a unified um army which seems to be very very difficult for them as i said before with the factional 
different factions and different functions and different things that they have everyone divided into. And so more and more you find coercion and control is the norm as, I, as you grow up and you start to become aware of your independence in the collective they start getting a bit heavy-handed on keeping and maintaining that control. Um, I think the ultimate aim is that they want to amass an army big enough to, uh, I suppose, take on Earth or take on heaven, whatever that is. There, there's a massive, massive push for boosting numbers and to innovate technology um, at an accelerated rate uh, in a desperate bid to outgun whatever they've got lined up as their target. But as I said, out in deep space, there are other things beside them that are hostile to them and they, and with the internal fracturing within them as well, I would seriously doubt that they're going to be very successful in their endeavors. Now, you explained to us that you were selected mm. and you had imaginary friends, so you called them imaginary friends. Now, can you break down how these imaginary friends explained to you why you were selected and your importance for the mission? Yeah, that was a story that changed as I got older. Um, so it always started off like you are very important. You are special. You are, you are something that hasn't been seen before. And so this is why we selected you. And your, your knowledge is important or your family is important. As, a, as I grew up and as I started learning new things, they had to update their story to make sure that the new information that I learned didn't upset their narrative. So it was one of those constantly changing things where it's like, well, oh, you're on the next stage of human, human evolution. Uh, or they'd say, or it, like when I thought that was nonsense, it was just like, uh, you're from a very high born family who was ostracized from their, their rightful place in, in society. And then when I actually learned the history proper, that kind of fell apart. Then it was just kind of like, oh, you've been chosen by God. You're a prophet. You're this, you know, amazing psychic spiritual person. And it, it changed. Like, the, like I said, the stories that they tried, that coddling paternalistic aspect of them obviously wasn't their natural approach because they they, that kept falling away more and more and they just became more domineering and coercive over time. Okay. <laughs> so, you had exposure to Christianity. Yes. When did that start? So, I was born in a Christian home. Uh, we had trouble with churches just because of the nature of what was going on with the family. And so it wasn't, we didn't stay in one particular place for too long, but over the course of our uh, journeying, we did make some very good born again, believer friends. And they were, they were praying for me. They were, they were looking out for me. They were very conscious conscious of my problems and they were as perplexed as anyone else but they were they took the right approach and started praying and so um god reached out to me the one way he knew how which was through my head and i started having dreams how where old? i would encounter god how old were you when this part started it was after when I was 16. So it really was my parents took their hands off and said, what, what can we do? And at that point, God stepped in and, and really took the reins from there. Um, so 
And this was the point where the whole parental veneer of the collective just completely vanished. Uh, you know, after you've seen the, the glory of God, everything else starts becoming much clearer really quickly. <laughs> and so I remember this one waking vision that I had where I had just been to a Christian camp and like I said, autistic people have an understanding of when they're being loved and when they're being looked after. And I had really felt loved and looked after at this Christian camp. And there was something within me that kind of leapt when I was around these people. And so I was coming back home, which was this camp out of town. Um, and I heard this voice saying, you think you can get away from us that easily? We're not going to let you do that. And so that was the first attempt on my life by these beings. That was semi-successful. I saw them come into my waking field. Um, and they just, they started off with as these beings that looked kind of human. And that the more they stepped into the light, they just turned into these slavering dog things. And they just started ripping into me. Um, and then from the sidelines, I saw this, I saw this man and I called out to him and he comes in. He has this cane in his hand that when he steps into the light, he can, he's actually a knight and he has a sword and he just lays into these demons scoops me up and takes me away into this high tower. Uh, and the next thing I know, I'm in one piece and I'm sitting in the lap of, of God and he starts talking to me about his purpose and his destiny for me. And he shows me a few different things. Like he showed me a bird. It's like, what, what are birds meant to do? And he's like, oh, they're meant to fly. And he's like, so are you. Why are you crawling in the dirt? And then he showed me a diamond with all the pieces that have been cut off it. And he says, do you think the diamond enjoyed that process of being cut and polished? And he's like, no. And he's like, well, this is what's happening with you. And then he showed me an animal, you know, in the cityscape. And, and with all the cars and different things around it, and, and he said, do you think this animal is afraid? And I was like, no. And then he said, and then he says, does it have reason to be afraid? And I saw all the cars and stuff. And I was like, yes. And so he says, he has reason to be afraid, but he is not. You have no reason to be afraid. And yet you are. And that was my introduction. My first meeting with God. And so... For the next couple of years, I would have these really, really wild yo-yo tug of war things going on where I would have an encounter with the living father and then be chastised for it by my overlords. Goodness. And it extended to the point where they were actively trying to kill me. I remember this one particular vision where I... I was in my bed, I was, I had chronic pneumonia at that point. Like my body had deteriorated from this battle over the years to the extent where I was actually dying. And so um, in this vision, I had something in my hand and I, and I heard Jesus say, let it go, let it go, you need to let it go now. And so I let go of it and I felt a pop in my chest and suddenly I was like, had so much more room to breathe. The next thing I know, I see this demon slinking up onto my bed with a long dagger in my hand. He puts his hand, puts his hand on my chest and then he looks confused, he looks around, he looks on the floor and he doesn't know what's going on. And then he goes away. And then I see Jesus come into the room and is, there is my still beating heart in his hand, like pumping away. In, in his hand and he said right now it is too dangerous for you to have this i'm going to put this in safekeeping until such time as you can 
So the next morning I get up and I'm freaking out because I have no pulse. I, I breathe in, I can still breathe in that extra, extra bit. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? And the pneumonia had lifted, but I could breathe more than I naturally could. And now I had no pulse. I walk up to, I go and I check my scales. Overnight, I had lost a kilo and a half instantly. God had taken my physical heart out of my body because I was at risk of being killed. My goodness. That is extraordinary. So immediately, I have a newfound respect for Jesus because I have no way of knowing whether these encounters that I'm having with my, with these demons are physical and natural or just in my mind. Jesus gives me a physical sign straight up. So what did you do? What did I do? So at this point in time, uh, these friends who have been praying for me, uh, ascertain that, that that these things about my deteriorating body and my deteriorating mental health and my constant ravings about seeing monsters all the time maybe this is spiritual um <laughs> and so they line me up to have a session with this out of town uh prayer ministry and it sort of popped up this, this church was trying uh it tried, did it for like two or three times in a year. And so I, it's this beautiful um, bed and breakfast out in, out in the woods, in the mountains. And so they, they introduced me. So each person in the prayer retreat gets their own prayer team to pray with them through whatever they want to talk about. And so I might meet this lovely older couple and they're just like, well, we're going to pray for you. Like, do you want to share anything that, that's going on? And it's like, well, I've been having these weird encounters all through my life, really. And, you know, life at home is pretty hard and all that kind of stuff. It's like, that's okay. We'll, we'll start praying for you. They start praying for me. Um, my eyes turn black, like jet black all the way through. And my tongue starts sticking out nearly a foot out of my face. And I'm just like, uh, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and they're turning white. And they're just like, we need to get the leader in here. And over the course of 48 hours of nearly nonstop prayer, they start casting demons out of me. And this is the thing. It's like, I'd seen these things outside of me. I'd seen, I'd seen these things around me. I didn't realize that there were things inside me when I wasn't seeing them. So the first one to go was a Kundalini spirit, the reptile. So the, there was a snake. That was what was holding my tongue. When I closed my eyes, I saw this guy, this lizard guy with teeth, with his teeth in my tongue, hanging off me over a lake of fire. Goodness. And I'm just like, okay, so this is what I'm seeing, guys. <laughs> so now okay let me just pause you there mm. autism mm. is a physical condition affecting the brain yes and simultaneous for you a mm. spiritual issue yeah. affecting the spirit the soul and the body yes and you were under the influence of an almost like a patchwork overlay. Yes. Can you explain the nature of how these different spirits had mm. uh, converged to hold yeah. you in this state? So I had an overlay of seven. So there was a grid work of, of these demons and each one had a particular effect on my person to create the scenario that they needed for me to be separate from humanity. So you had 
the two there were and they worked in in teams so you had some that worked on the body some that worked on my psychic ability my uh, ability to interact with other demons and others that that were interacting on my social circles to make sure that people only interacted with me on a certain wavelength and so the two that I recognize as ones that were dealing with the spirit. No, there's three. So there was the snake, the werewolf, and the goat. So the goat would be Azazel, which is the false wilderness experience, going off into the wilderness to commune with the spirits. Uh, you had uh, the werewolf, you know, the, the rage monster that, that would pop out. And then you had the kundalini which you know was the spiritual energy to conduct magic or whatever they needed and required at that time then you had another team of of spirits that were um working on my body so there was a a worm a canker worm in my chest that inhibited in my internal organs and i also had a cripple that was wrapped around my legs that made it impossible for me to develop properly or to run or to that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally you had the mama who was out affecting my perception on others. So that they would only re re react to me in a particular way and not break through. Um, and interestingly, beyond that, um, there was the spirit of Absalom, which was kind of like the overseer of the whole thing. You know, political espionage and rebellion and backstabbing, being part of what we were talking about last week that Brodies do. Of course, you're going to have a spirit of Absalom in, in the mix with that. Wow. So all now, those, yeah. Um, so you had this grid of demons mm. that were overlaid on your body and your brain, really, mm. holding in this physical, you know, issue with the brain. Mm. But there was something that we talked about privately. I want to make sure you get a chance to speak to it here. Mm leading up to this deliverance where your eyes turn black, your tongue comes out 48 hours of straight prayer. Mm. Okay. Which had a cascade following. We're going to get to that in a minute. God began to speak to you about personal accountability and ownership. And, and here's the thing. I just want to preface this with the statement, you know, a lot of people, you know, myself included. Yeah. I actually substituted in public schools for a period of time. You know, there's a certain understanding of autistic children. It's not their fault. Whatever they do, mm. however they act, they're the victim of circumstance. Now, I want to let you speak to that as well as the way God was dealing with you leading up to all of this. Mm. So one of the things, so in between that period of time where Jesus took my heart out um, because it was no longer safe, and between and the period of my deliverance um god set forth the challenge for me he wanted me to learn something about me and the impact i had on others he said i don't want you to talk unless you're answering a question for 17 weeks 17 weeks of silence 17 weeks of no interruptions 17 weeks of yes or no and that's it you can't interject, you can't correct, you can't spout forth your plentiful knowledge as it was. Um, <laughs> you, you aren't allowed to spout forth this stuff anymore for 17 weeks. And it was like, okay, you know, me being the superior Ubermensch that I was, is like challenge accepted. Um, <laughs> And so 17 weeks works out to be over three months. 
the first month, it kind of occurred to me how argumentative I was with people. Like I have to physically restrain myself from speaking. The second month, I actually started to be able to hear what people were actually saying and actually start to comprehend it, that people actually had their own lives and they weren't just interacting with me to find out things about me. They was actually had their own worlds. By the third month, people had gotten so used to the fact that I wasn't talking that they were starting to interact with their own lives as though I didn't, I wasn't there. And I started to realize how much lighter they were without me heaping stuff on them. And out of that experience, God told me that there was a, the impact that I'm having on people is negative. The fruit of what I'm bringing is bitterness. And the, the overall um, contribution to the people around me was actually tearing them apart. Um, and, and then, you know, at the end of that period, he actually showed me a vision to really um, signify that. He's like, I saw myself with these vines growing out of my back and they were catching people and ensnaring them and tying them up. Um, and they were as trapped as I was. And so there's this web of bitterness that was emanating from me, but it was spreading far beyond me because of the impact I was having on the people who were nearest to me. And he said, you need to take account for what you have done to these people. You have done damage and you need to repent. How'd you take that? That was, it was interesting because the way he did it, like he didn't say it straight up. He didn't show me that image straight up. He got me to experience my impact on people and what life was like with the absence of my impact and how much better people were. Um, because the, the point of it was that he was trying to get me to a point where I would accept being born again. As I was, I could not continue forward in what he had me, had for me. I had to die and be born again in order for him to fully release me of all of this. He, he said in another vision, um, he showed me all these different tumors in my body in this vision and it said, there is too many, I can't operate. And so what he did in this vision, he picked me whole up and threw me into fire and I burned down to completely to ash, but then out of the ash, he recreated me as something else entirely fresh and new. He said, I can't operate on you. I can't cut these things out. All of you needs to go and all of you needs to come back. I need to start afresh with you. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> fast forward. Mm -hmm. 48 hours of prayer. Some of the yeah. stuff breaks off. Yeah. What happens? So, oh man, the, the next couple of weeks, uh, some of the wildest times. Uh, so I go from this high functioning person with uh, no prospects of leaving home or going and achieving anything to, I come home, I'm in my right mind. I talk to my parents and say, I really think I need to move out. And in a matter of six weeks, I find a place in Bendigo. I live, my hometown is like more than two hours away. I'd never, I've only been to Bendigo twice in my life. And I said, I'm going to move there. And so I arranged a place to, to stay and I moved out. Then once the sort of hubbub of and elation of the, the whole thing subsided, 
I started experiencing things that I hadn't experienced before, namely shame and realization and awareness of what I was like to people. Uh, that was very hard to get over and very hard to explain to people. Uh, and people, the first lot of people I came into contact with didn't react very well to me. Um, so there was a long process of healing to come afterwards. So deliverance and healing don't always go hand in hand. Um, some things need to be learned. And when you've been 20 years demonized and don't even recognize yourself as human, uh, there's going to be a lot of culture shock coming back to the real world. Uh, I'd never taken public transport. I'd never um, held down a job. I'd never done anything like that. It was all brand new to me. And I was learning how to socialize with people on a kindergarten level as a 22 year old man and going through all the processes of learning how to trust people, learning what to share, what not to share, you know, who, who's a good person to have in your life and, and what all that kind of stuff. I learned all that stuff that most people would learn in their primary school years as a grown man, whilst also trying to come off as a grown man to not freak people out. And so there was a couple of years of just wandering listlessly, um, you know, from place to place, trying to make friends, trying to break ground, trying to feel like I could ever be normal. So although the demons were gone, I was still being treated like a nutcase. And so, um, Long story short, I come across these people in the way and they seem really on fire. They seem to have an understanding of things of the spirit. They don't immediately freak out when I start talking to them about anything prior to my moving to Bendigo. Um, and so I start making friends and so begins the, the really delicate and an interesting process of uh, learning to integrate into a human family for the first time. And so learning basic things like um, when you're over at someone's place and they, they're saying, well, it's time to go turn it in for the night. That's not an invitation for you to ju just crash on their couch. Um, <laughs> or, you know, keeping track of you know, your female friend's cycles might be convenient for you to know when to interact with people, but it's really freaky when people figure out what you're doing. <laughs> like, stuff like that. It's like really basic human stuff. Um, and, you know, the big thing was um, just because you know you can form a pattern of a person's behavior and can figure out where a person's going to be so you can go find them and talk to them. Doesn't mean that they're going to be less creeped out when you suddenly appear at their place of work wanting to have a chat. You know, there are things called phones and you're actually supposed to check in with people before you catch up with them, not just track them down. <laughs> and it's like simple stuff like that. <laughs> Folks, this is deep wisdom. <laughs> this is deep wisdom um okay i want to uh, come back on a few things just to iron it all out so mm -hmm. was your brain healed simultaneously with this 48 hour deliverance process yes i had an awareness of who i was i could be present i could I could see and recognize people as people. And um, I, like I said, I developed a self-awareness of what I was like. Uh, that was instantaneous. Uh, the behaviors around how to actually behave around people, 
that's stuff you learn. And so if you haven't learned it, you're not going to do it straight away. So what do you say at this point were the major keys to your deliverance from autism? If you were just to summarize three points, four points, like looking at the story. So I think the summary is that I think people try to tackle autism as a singular thing. Like what we've said before, just before is like, it's an overlay of different things that, that manifest as autism. So you might have, and different people have different demons in, in their overlay. Like if you add, say a deaf and dumb spirit, you have an autistic kid that can't talk at all. Uh, you, add, you add or remove any one of these things, you'll get a slightly different flavor of autism. And so when tackling autism, rather than saying, I want to tackle the spirit of autism, break it down even further. It's like, I want to tackle the, t the spirit that's causing this particular thing that you do. Um, the other thing too is um, these people, if, if my experience is commonplace, these people need to be protected in the lead up to deliverance because their overlords are going to try and take them out. It is very dangerous for someone who has been entrusted with information to be released for them, obviously. Wow. So they need to be protected. Obviously, I was divinely protected mm -hmm. by Jesus at the time. Uh, but be conscious that, yeah, without that process of um, understanding that these people are essentially um, vital pieces of equipment in the enemy's army, and he's not going to give it up easily without a fight. Uh, if you're going to do deliverance, do it quickly. That was, would be my advice. Um, but yeah, guidance from the Holy Spirit. Always, to, always seek the Holy Spirit. Be covering them in intercession and protection. So, and also, please, sorry. Please, no, continue. Yeah, and also that whole process, understand that once the demons are gone, there's a whole process of learning and probably waves and waves of shame and um, realization and uh, self doubt and all that kind of stuff that's going to come over this person. And so, tracking with them, loving on them, you know, incorporating them into family sooner rather than later so that they can actually observe and learn. Uh, normal, healthy relationships and normal, healthy behavior. Um, that's key as well, because that's the healing. The, the, it, it seems it, like in my case, the, the deliverance and the healing uh, were two separate things and, they, and the healing happened over time through loving interaction. That's really, really good. So, um... Man, this is deep. This is mm. deep. So I, I'm gonna be honest, you know, just kind of going back over your story, I have interceded for um, people's autistic children, you know, mm. we've done work. And one of the things that we have run into almost without fail, once we get deep into the spirit is that pieces of the soul are being held captive in hybrids. Mm. We keep running into it. Mm. And sometimes those pieces of the soul, and this was in the early days back in 2015, 2016, when I first started running into this, were protected by, um, you know, sacred geometries, force fields, matrices of protection, sealing those soul parts into the hybrid entities. So mm. we had a very, we didn't have success mm. getting soul parts out of these things to then see to a, kind of like intercessory driven deliverance for for an autistic child of someone per se mm. um 
I, I just see so many confirmations in your story of the stuff that like, you know, I ran into it years ago and I'm just thinking, is, can this be, is this real? Mm. Um, now I, I want to ask this question, right? Because you've been on both sides of this. You, you were autistic, you know what it's like to be, you know, in that mindset that mm. everyone is here to bend to my will. Mm -hmm. And now on the other side where you've learned social grace, I mean, you're, you're, you're successfully married now, you have a job, yes. you have a church community. I mean, you're talking to me like, an, it's just amazing yeah. what the Lord is and all credit goes to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, what is it like for you to engage with people that are deep in their autism? It's, it's tricky because I can relate. But the thing is, there's, there's still that divide. Um, like I can empathize in as much as I can, I can remember what it was like for me and I can explain it to people. But the big brick wall is that pride and that lack of self-awareness. Like a lot of autistic people that I've come across will insist that there's nothing wrong with them. They're fine how they are. And they don't mind the fact that they don't have the things that other people have because they don't want them. And I think that's the key for me was that getting over the pride thing. Um, and that uh, that's the brick wall that I keep coming across is that ultimately that person doesn't see a problem with their life. Um, whether it's because people have just been accommodating to them or something like that, there hasn't been a, a resistance or an awareness of a lack that drives them to actually want to break out of it. Um, which is the, the most frustrating thing that I come across, but it's just really interesting. Like I've had deep conversations with parents, with autistic kids. I know a few and the, and that can be tricky as well because it's just if I yeah imagine me telling someone's parent of their six-year-old kid is like well when I was that age I was eating people and blowing up planets and whatnot you know that's not something your parent, a parent wants to hear so it's it's tricky I it's I, I do come across it and I do, I do with as much grace as I can try to encourage them. It's like, this kid is not doing well. This kid is probably in pain. This kid is probably wanting to get out of it. Uh, but there are things in place that are, that are resisting that. And you need to be, you know, take your authority in Jesus and stand up to that. Um, don't capitulate to them as hard as it might seem is like you, you're still the parent in this situation. <laughs> that that's deep. I mean, yeah. you do know that what you're saying goes completely contrary to like the, the main line. Yeah. I, I am quite alarmed with the main line opinion. I think if I had been exposed to the kind of rhetoric that we have around, um, you know, different mentally abled people, that kind of movement that's happening now. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, the Indigo Children movement in the New Age, Starseed, all that kind of stuff. All these things that are really feeding into that pride, because it's the pride that really gets in the way. You know, if that, unless that kid wants to repent and actually wants out of what they're in, there's not a lot you can, you can break things down. You can break the bars, but they, they won't necessarily walk out of the cell if they don't feel that there's anything on the other side that they gain from having, from being free. Because we now have a system in place that actually, that, you know, allows them to be the little dictators that they're being programmed to be. My Controversial goodness. stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you what, well, look, um, you're saying it as someone mm. who's taken this journey with God. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of weight behind what you're saying. You know, mm. 
I don't disagree with you. Mm. Uh, it's hard, you know, people are learning to approach autism from the standpoint that look, these children are victims of their own circumstance. Mm -hmm. They need to be um, received however they present. And mm -hmm. everyone around them needs to bend over backwards because they can't handle more stress than they're already in. Mm. Yeah, which is, you know, you are putting bars on their prison. You're oh reinforcing it. Oh my. You, you know, in that case, you're actually contributing to the problem if, you, if you're allowing that to proceed. The first things first, I would advise to people who think that way is that you need to repent. You're engaging and reinforcing a child's suffering and robbing them of humanity. And you pinpoint the big, big hurdle as pride. Because mm. you're programmed to be superior. Wow. You are the Ubermensch. You are the super soldier. You are the thousand year old reptile, you know, who gets to eat these monkeys. <laughs> you know, 20 years of that kind of programming does not lead to a repentant heart that is willing to accept the transformative power of the Holy Spirit or to accept Jesus as Lord or to become born again. It's pride is one of the hardest things to overcome. And what we need to do as a society is actually call it out when we see it. So you said at the beginning of the first interview, the first part, mm. you have, a, a much better relationship with your parents now. Yeah. And I want to let you talk a little bit about the evolution of that improved relationship, because, you know, there are a lot of, I'm telling you what, there are a lot of broken parents that are going to listen to this program. It's just, yeah. you know, we're going to name it and people are going to listen to it. it it's just, mm. there's a lot of people looking for hope and answers. And I'm, I, I've been one of them for a long time because I know mm. a lot. And here's the thing, right? You, you mentioned a bloodline thing being selected and chosen. I, I think that children from bloodline families are a little predisposed to autism yeah. because of the role of the bloodlines in the clan. Yeah, the, the, the opening of iniquity is so wide for them. There's so many opportunities for them to be assessed and looked over and, and, and selected by the familiar spirits that pass on through the family line. Uh, the, the, the chances of them being autistic are higher, but it doesn't mean that, that the enemy is not going to be opportunist, opportunistic and pick others. Very good. So yeah. how did your relationship with your parents evolve upon your healing? Um, I, think the, I think by the stage when I was healed, they were burnt out. Mm -hmm. They were sick of me, you know, my dad even commented that I, he wished I wouldn't barge in on topics all the time because I make things worse. Um, so at the time that they that I was fully healed, they were burnt out. Um, I think they were in a state of shock when I said I need to move out. Um, but by that same token, they were just kind of, I think they were kind of relieved that I was going to go away. And so over the course of several years, they, it was just really interesting. They went through we weird and wild stages of saying, oh, you've improved. You know, that's something that might happen with autism or they might say, well, you were never really that autistic and or something like that. Like there was all these stages of denial and stages of not understanding from both sides. Like I went through a long stage of blaming mum and dad for all of this. And then God had to correct me for that. Um, and so, um, but over time, oh, and then there was this weird stage where they talked to me like I was five years old. Like I didn't understand what was going on. But I think over time, especially when I got into the way and I was starting to learn how to respect and how to speak respectfully and how to interact with people uh, in a way that honors them. And especially when, as I got um, 
more recognized as a, as a young leader in the church as well. Cause that's the thing. It's like, I'm not just part of a church. I'm a young adults leader in the church. Now I, I worked with children for years. That was a scary thought. <laughs> that's incredible. It's so cool. It's so cool. Cause this thing is so radically different. And when they st- when my parents started observing how much other people respected me as a person who was their peer and their equal, they really woke up to the fact that this is not the same Ben that we had in our house. Um, and yeah, so we started developing this really cool friendship. Um, like there's, there's, there's always things with family that, you know, they, you're not always going to see eye to eye on everything, but the, there is a level of respect and love there that wasn't there before um, where, you know, they're actually interacting me with me as a person that they would actually be proud of um, and actually want to spend time with. And by extension, um, my siblings came around to that understanding as well. They took them, took them a little longer because they were smaller than me and I could, I could wail on them. Um, and so, yeah, for me, for, to them, I was an abuser. And so mending that relationship uh, took a bit more time. Um, and so a lot of soul bearing, a lot of um, deep talk, a lot of repentance and apologizing and, and actually demonstrating yourself trustworthy over time. And that's, and that's that aspect of healing that a lot of people overlook. They, they don't want to go through that process of actually mending bridges and actually burying hatchets and actually going through the motions of rebuilding a relationship. And, you know, I've got friends and, and other people who won't go through that with me and you just gotta, you know, take it as it comes. Benjamin, I'm going to tell you what, you are a beacon of hope. And I'm going to say this, by faith. I believe that God has a radical move of healing for autism Mm -hmm. that will be poured out into the earth. Yes. I believe you're a type of first fruits, man. And so um, for those of you that are listening to this, um, there's hope in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Benjamin, it has been such a joy to have you on the podcast and to have you sharing your testimony. And um, I, I just want to say thank you. No, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been an absolute delight being on the show. Well, folks, that is the story of Benjamin Brody. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to his spiritual leaders, Todd mm-hmm. and Britt Hunter. Uh, we love you guys at Pride Ministries. And folks, until next time, God bless. Thank God. You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like our video, and share this with friends. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at brideministriesinternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially.